Hi, hello everybody and welcome to our second uh, version or second episode of the official Cyblogs podcast, otherwise known as TOSP. Um, I'm Amy Whitcroft. And I'm Elf Eldridge. And once again, we'll be bringing you some of the interesting science-related goodness that we found over the week. Um, links to everything that we mentioned can be found on the TOSP blog, which is cyblogs.co.nz forward slash T-O-S-P. All right, jumping straight in, uh, as we like to do. The first thing this week is dinosaur-related. Um, as we mentioned last week, we think dinosaurs are pretty cool, so we like to include dinosaur stuff when we can find it. Mm-hmm. And in fact, this is pre-dinosaur, which is why it's so interesting. Um, they've discovered uh, the tunnels left behind by a very sophisticated underground animal. Um, these tunnels are reckoned to be about 240 million old, uh, 240 million years old, sorry, which predates the uh, dinosaurs by about 10 million years. Um, The beastie in question was apparently sort of 20 to 25 centimeters long, um, had five fingered um, feet with claws on it, and dug these um, quite complex tunnels to escape uh, not only from predation, apparently there were crocodile type uh, precursors running around eating things, but also to escape from um, the environment, from extremes of temperature um, and so forth. And archeologists, uh, sorry, not archeologists, um, dinosaur people, paleontologists, are very excited to see that digging burrows appears to be a very, very ancient stratagem for um, escaping nasty stuff in the world above. <laughs> oh, wow. Very, very cool. Speaking of nasty stuff in the world above, this wins the prize for the best title. It's um, from a blog called uh, Bad Astronomy from Discover Magazine's website, and the, art- the title of the article is Astronomers Discover a Wretched Hive of Scum and Villainy, <laughs> which is just fantastic. It's a note that in Nature this week there was a paper published discovering uh, the first planet that orbits two stars at the same time. So we've discovered lots of exoplanets outside of our solar system. There's well over a 1,000 mm. candidates at the moment. But this is the first one um, that's been confirmed that's actually orbiting around two central stars. Usually uh, all the other exoplanets that we've found orbit one of the two stars. And this particular one, which is found by a planet transiting method, so um, it's about the size of Saturn and it passes in between Earth and one of those two suns and it dims the light ever so slightly. So um, we can only see it because the planet is quite big and because the system is actually relatively close. But it's the first time we've ever found something like this which is pretty cool that is fantastic uh, a quick note um, before we move on I've got a terrible cold so I'm going to apologize for the sniffling and the throat clearing and the mucus um, <laughs> and Elf's sexy sexy voice today is brought to you by uh, wandering around the waterfront for several hours dressed like a pirate he's still in the costume going R at people because tomorrow is well we'll talk about that later and why Elf might be dressed like a pirate yeah, so, so we apologize for our voices this week <laughs> it's it's the special voice edition okay cool the next one um, it's actually two but but one of them is very, very short. Um, many of our listeners will no doubt be familiar with PhD Comics, um, a scathing and absolutely accurate look at the life of being a grad student, uh, particularly in the state system, but from all the PhD students I know all over the world, it seems to be accurate of pretty much everyone's experience. Um, and a movie is being made, uh, which is is very exciting. Um, it will have real live people in it. Um, certainly we're curious to see how well the transition is managed between um, online cartoon strip and movie, but it, it's quite exciting and they are very funny. And anybody who's not read them, um, have a look at phdcomics.com and have a bit of a giggle. Uh, Elf, I believe. They'll, um, the the cool thing about the live action version is that they'll actually be played by grad students, not by actors as well. So if the acting's appalling, it's because the grad students are completely hungover and have no idea what's going on. Fantastic. There is also going to be a free screening of it up here at Vic on the twi- on the evening of the 29th of September. So again, check out the website for details on that if you're interested in coming along and having a look at the full length film. I'm I'm probably going to try and be here. Hopefully, several beers in, as as feels appropriate for a movie <laughs> of this sort. But uh, yeah, it should be great, good fun. All right. So after that short one, onto something a little bit more sciencey and data like. Um, this is interesting. It comes from not exactly rocket science, which is the absolutely brilliant science blog written by um, Ed Young, who's a British science writer. And this is about um, the wisdom of crowds, uh, known by a bunch of names, including Swarm Intelligence. I like that one. Uh, Vox Populi. Um, and so forth. It's the idea that a crowd of people can come up with a better and more accurate answer than any one individual might on their own. So um, uh, examples, rather, that are used are getting people to estimate how many beans there are 
in a jar. And in fact, a scientist from the Royal Veterinary College did exactly this. The actual number of beans in the jar was 752, sorry, sweets in a jar. Um, and the crowd's median guess, um, and please note the use here of median, not mean, was 751, which is remarkable. Um, what is interesting, however, is that it, this kind of accuracy is only found when people are operating in a vacuum, so they don't know what anybody else is guessing. And what he found, and another scientist, uh, Jan Lawrence, have found is that if people do know what other people are saying, it actually skews the accuracy and people tend to start overestimating enormously, which might help uh, go some way to explaining things like housing bubbles, all of that sort of thing. Um, unless you tell them what the most correct answer so far has been, or the closest answer has been, which is difficult to do in any kind of real life situation, because often one won't know. Um, the research does, of course, show how important it is uh, to choose people to listen to because of course a lot of us go to experts in a field or follow someone on Twitter that we think is interesting and that can skew uh, a crowd, the crowd wisdom as well but um, very very interesting piece of research so careful who you pay attention to and um, yeah that was actually the main message <laughs> out of it but uh, very very interesting just to see how accurate people can be um, in a crowd Right, well, next one is from me, and it's over uh, from the Science magazine. So, again, Science has a great podcast of their own, so you can go and have a look at this. But I thought it was well worth mentioning because it's just weird. So the article's called Faking Giants, the Evolution of High Prey Clearance Rates in Jellyfishes. And what they've shown is that jellyfishes uh, have actually, and yes, jellyfishes is the correct <laughs> plural, not jellyfish. We it had a discussion. Multiple species of jellyfish, so there's like a double plural in there. <laughs> um, but... Grammar aside, uh, what the jellyfish have done is that they've actually replaced overexploited uh, fishing stock from planktivorous fishes, which is quite strange because you don't expect um, jellyfish to be a particularly elegant or particularly sophisticated or particularly competitive predator. No. But they have done, and it turns out that even though they're very, very simplistic predators, they are incredibly efficient, and they've mm. evolved this way by getting bigger and by actually drifting slower and by capturing um, by capturing more water and thus more plankton just purely by getting bigger and there's a wonderful um, there's a wonderful line in the article that I just wanted to finish off with that says hinting at a future of gelatinous ocean reminiscent of the early um, Idia current and I just I love the idea of a ocean made entirely out of jellyfish Absolutely. so don't overfish the fish or we'll get stuck with goo <laughs> well I've, I've seen a number of articles over the years sort of talking about jellyfish burgers and, and what, what we might be forced to eat in the coming years now um, don't hate me if I get the details in this wrong but I do remember an article a couple of, of months ago um, talking about why jellyfish becoming a predominant carnivore could be um, a bad thing in the oceans and it's that they aren't particularly digestible when they die and they fall through the water column whereas most other uh, well organisms at all are eaten by all kinds of bacteria and other fishies and other beasties jellyfish flesh for, for want of a better word isn't actually terribly digestible I think there's one species of bacteria or maybe a couple that are able to live on it and nothing else can um, live on those so it's basically this huge amount of lost energy which is potentially problematic Potentially, until something finds a way of exploiting it. True that. Which, because of life, it always will. True that. <laughs> and I have to say, jellyfish burgers, I, um, I, I'm not in love with the idea, but it will be interesting. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, this, is, this is really exciting news. Um, many of you will be familiar with the uh, polio virus, which causes the disease poliomyelitis. Um, shorthand is polio, which is... In about 1% of the cases um, of people who, who contract this virus, which is contracted through sewage and, and nasty water and things, um, it attacks nerves, so it becomes a wasting and, and eventually a sort of a paralytic disease in um, the limbs that are affected. And it's, it's absolutely terrible. Um, it's been predominantly wiped out in the Western world, but it's still a major, major issue in third world countries. Um, not only does it kill but but more than that it just destroys quality of life entirely um i'm sure people will have seen pictures of of little kids who you know on crutches because one leg is completely wasted uh, all that kind of thing growing up in south africa as i did we we still occasionally saw cases of it there um and india has a massive problem with polio to get back on to, on, on track and a fantastic article this week um 
is suggesting that, well, there's a lot of excitement amongst people who fight polio in India because it looks maybe, just maybe, like it may have been eradicated there. Um, the uh, organizations, including the UN, have been on a very aggressive vaccination campaign there. And it's been some 10 or so months since outbreaks from the most sort of outbreak-ridden provinces have been seen um, for both strains one and three. Um, really? Yeah. And so this doesn't mean that it's that it's gone, but it's potentially quite exciting. So everyone's sort of watching with bated breath because if so, that would that would be quite a cue. And it's something I've been pointing out to people this week in uh, the anti-vax people vaccination uh, deniers or, or people who say, you know, what good have vaccines ever done us? I, I like to point them to this article and there's some good graphs and stuff and say this, this is what vaccination does. This saves the lives and the quality of life of, of thousands, millions of people. It's mm. it's an absolutely stunning coup if, if it has happened. And if they haven't eliminated it completely, it's right on the brink. So congratulations to everybody involved in um, in that work. That's it. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Do know that polio doesn't express symptoms in all of its cases. No. So uh, it's going to be very difficult to tell if we have completely eradicated it, especially somewhere like India when you have such... It's so difficult to test so many people. Exactly. But it's, it's really promising to see. Yeah, very, very exciting. Um, and, and apparently there are still orphan cases. Some some of the regions are a bit uh, more difficult to do surveillance on. But... but it's it's hopeful. Um, it's there, there's one stat here. Let me look at it. Ah, here, um, cases across the country plunged from 741 in 2009 to just 42 in 2010 to just one in 2011. Wow. That's the kind of drop that wow. we're seeing. That is cool. So that yeah, is very very cool. That's 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 happy science news. I love I love seeing news like that. There's so much doom and gloom, and that's just cool. 